I want to focus uh, this morning less on the broad range of approaches that have been taken here at the University of Dayton and many of our institutions have had similar uh, approaches to trying to revitalize uh, the particular mission and identity of our campuses. I really want to focus today on the, on the issue of hiring for mission because I think ultimately the work that has been done in these conferences over the last 16 years will depend upon a new emphasis on the role of faculty in ways that uh, we haven't attempted in the past. It's important to acknowledge that every age has a tendency to understand itself as uh, an age of crisis. Nonetheless, I think that we're rightly conscious of a general crisis of the university in our own time. In the last 10 years, there have been a variety of books coming out giving an account of this situation, both from a secular and a religious point of view. And at the same time, the discussions about the specific challenges and promise of Catholic higher education has developed uh, in, a, in a similar way. I'd like to say that I think that the debate takes a new form uh, over the last seven to 10 years. And I agree with Archbishop Michael Miller uh, when in 2005 at the University of Notre Dame, he said that the issue now is no longer how minimally Catholic a university can be and still claim to be Catholic. Uh, that we need to turn our attention to deeper questions. He argued that we may not be in a position uh, to pick up the language of Gravissimum Educationis, uh, the document on education at the Second Vatican Council, and to raise the question, how does a Catholic university honestly and effectively provide a Christian presence in the world of higher education? If we take that question seriously, the burden of proof now falls on the university itself and not on the church certifying it one way or the other. The challenge thus becomes whether a Catholic university can develop the institutional arrangements that clearly demonstrate its willingness to participate in the church's evangelizing mission as well as serving the common good. But what kind of Christian presence does the Catholic university promise and what resulting expectations does it have for its faculty? I think this is the fundamental question. Let me simply specify three basic concerns, which I think are at the heart of this issue. First, a concern for the exploration of and active commitment to the complementarity of faith and reason. That all faculty, whatever their discipline, ought to have some attention to and commitment to exploring that issue. Second, a sustained examination of the nature of the unity of knowledge, in addition to the discrete uh, disciplinary research uh, that is done within departments. This uh, was a key concern not only of Ex Cordia Ecclesiae, but the larger tradition of Catholic higher education. And finally, a concern, as Father Hef said, for the exploration of the distinctive character and present implications of the Catholic intellectual tradition itself. It is not self-evident that these concerns would require a predominantly Catholic faculty but I will try to defend the argument that certain essential features of them will require as part, but not all, of a hiring for mission policy, a strong focus on the recruitment of Catholic faculty. I'll try to clarify that point as I develop the paper. It seems to me that too often in discussions about mission-centered hiring, we've made the focus on the role of Catholics either irrelevant or uniquely essential. Surely there's a more nuanced middle ground that will reflect both the distinctive role of Catholic faculty in the university and the essential role of, Catholic, of faculty from other Christian traditions and religious faiths in securing these three concerns I mentioned earlier. Newman had argued that the church is necessary to the university's integrity, not merely in adding a spiritual dimension to what is essentially a secular project, but in steadying the university and the performance of its intellectual office. He argued that the circle of knowledge in which each discipline finds, its own, uh, finds in an ongoing tension its own ordered place requires an authority outside itself. In its absence, liberal education would move from the pursuit of truth from its own sake to a concern for mere beauty, ultimately reduced to a personal taste or sentiment. On the other hand, professional schools and he himself, of course, founded a school of law and medicine in the Catholic University of Ireland. Professional schools have moved in the direction of applied power. Of course, we've moved in both directions at once, trivializing the role of the humanities 
and instrumentalizing the work of the professions. In the last few years, Alistair McIntyre has begun to comment on Newman's vision of the university in what I think are very interesting ways. And he reflected on the implications of this loss of vision in the modern university, agreeing with Newman's argument that the principal task of the university is to form a particular habit of mind in its students, preparing them to see things in relation, to take a view, to form judgments about the nature of the realities they encounter. Instead, he argued, the narrow training of modern university education has produced not this capacity to see things whole, but in, instead um, to uh, be incapable, produce minds incapable of evaluating the very conditions they confront. He suggested that many of the most critical problems of our time, and he mentioned, for example, the current financial crisis, the war in Iraq, have been the result of educations which assume the adequacy of the limited perspectives of the disciplines, the specialized disciplines in which those responsible were formed, making it, them incapable of rightly seeing the complex realities for which they had a direct responsibility. Insofar as these converging arguments are correct, a wide variety of complementary reforms of the university will be required if it is to recover a more robust and coherent identity. This will have a specific character for Catholic higher education, but I'd like to suggest that the challenge is universal, not particular. This is not a unique problem for us. It's a problem for the university as such, uh, which is why so many people are questioning its current relevance and sustainability. At the heart of any reform will be renewed focus on the role of the faculty, a renewal which will require not only new approaches to hiring, but also, as Father Haft mentioned, for the creation of new faculty development initiatives, bringing faculty into a sustained, sustained connection with the role and life of the university as a whole, and especially with the three concerns I mentioned earlier. I'd like to explore some of the implications of these two faculty initiatives, hiring and faculty development, uh, in a focus more on a top-down approach uh, rather than the bottom-up approach, which Father Haft has clarified. In 1978, the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities asked uh, Father Jim Birchall to prepare a document on the specific mission and identity of Catholic higher education. Birchall had long argued that it is the faculty who ultimately express and define a university's deepest convictions. And in a 1972 homily at Notre Dame's Basilica of the Sacred Heart, he reminded the congregation that many of the great universities of the United States had arisen out of deep ecclesial com commitments but had gradually rejected any distinctive identification with their founding religious bodies. In the document Birchall prepared, he insisted that every quality that a college or university desires as an institutional characteristic must be embodied in its faculty. They are what most make it what it is. To seek academic excellence would be in vain, for instance, unless at every evaluation of faculty and in every personnel decision, this excellence or quality openly sought after. If an institution professes to be Catholic, not just nominally, but in ways that are intellectually inquisitive and morally committed, then it is similarly imperative that faculty and administrators unabashedly pursue and articulate those interests and those commitments in the recruitment and the advancement of colleagues. Neither intellectual excellence nor religious commitments nor any other positive value will exist within an institution unless each of those qualities is candidly recruited and evaluated and preferred in the appointment of faculty. The result of such a positive process must be a faculty among whom seriously committed and intellectually accomplished Catholics predominate. But as Chuck Zeck of Villanova University indicated over a decade ago, following a survey of Catholic colleges and universities in the US, very little energy is in place with regard to the type of faculty being hired. That is, the emphasis is restricted to a faculty member's academic credentials rather than insisting on people committed to the college's religious and intellectual mission and identity. Zach reported that many faculty reacted ne negatively to the very idea of a distinctive Catholic identity and indicated that the issue had no relevance for their understanding of their own work within their institutions. I give you three examples 
uh, which I don't think reflect the, the mainstream, but are certainly reflective of certain aspects of the problem we confront. One faculty member said, I am unconnected to Catholicism and have no desire or interest in its role for faculty or curriculum or vice versa. The Catholic character is irrelevant to me. I neither disparage it nor promote it. Another, to introduce the bias of any religion into education, as this survey suggests, is totally counterproductive to higher education itself. You should be ashamed of yourself for even suggesting it. A third, I'm profoundly disturbed by efforts to assign faculty and the curriculum a role in defining and promoting the Catholic character of any institution. These efforts are ill-advised, for they will hinder my institution's ability to be a first-rate university. They will regrettably maintain forever the university on a parochial basis. The general assumption here, I think, is the suggestion that the religious character of an institution is merely accidental. A Catholic university merely adds a spiritual dimension to what is essentially a secular enterprise. It may be of interest to those with private religious convictions, but it has no institutional significance. In 1990, in Ex Corte Ecclesiae, we found again another classic Catholic understanding of the role of the university, in which the Pope insisted uh, that the university was committed to a search for the truth, but was also conscious that it contained in Revelation, in Christ, the fount of truth. As a result, the Catholic University realizes in a complex tension two orders of reality which, are too, often, which too often seem to be antithetical, the ongoing search for the fuller understanding of truth, and a sustained reflection on the truth revealed and known. The Catholic University is not merely concerned with an open-ended search for truth, and this has important implications for the role of its faculty. Perhaps it is only in light of this distinction that one can understand his insistence that a Catholic university welcomes all authentic approaches to the truth and thus welcomes scholars from every conceivable background and religious commitment, and at the same time that Catholics must constitute a majority of the faculty as a whole. In the years since the publication of Ex Corte Ecclesiae, many Catholic universities have sought, with sometimes new and unexpected energy, to renew the Catholic identity and mission of their institutions and particularly in the last decade, have sought to address the issue of faculty hiring with greater purpose and clarity. However, I think, not unexpectedly, these new initiatives have not fared particularly well in confronting the, the, the difference. And I think that a hiring for mission policy as such, when not accompanied by the faculty development initiatives and campus-wide reflections that Father Heft is describing, uh, will not mark any advancement at all. Nonetheless, I think we have to take seriously the charge of creating new approaches to hiring. And hiring that is not only uh, in the terms of what Father Heft has called uh, at one point the small c Catholicism, but also the capital C of Catholicism. He said in what I think is a very penetrating point, in this practice, the small c focuses on ideas uh, almost everyone will find acceptable, the dimension of Catholicism that is all-inclusive, that affirms a both-and approach, celebrates the value of reasoning, the natural law tradition, and themes related to creation. In doing so, such people feel they're able to avoid what appear to them as sharper and less attractive aspects of Catholicism, namely the magisterium, dogmas, moral teaching on homosexual acts and contraception that seem increasingly hard to defend, and the proclamation of Jesus as one as the Lord and Savior. I understand why people feel the need to emphasize the small c. However, I simply want to say that without the big c, the small c will soon become Christian values and before long a bland humanism and eventually all that is truly distinctive of Catholicism will likely disappear. I think this is the case and it also suggests the challenge. How do we, in the light of the diversity of our institutions, both sustain an ongoing reflection on its implications and also seek a, university, uh, a uni unity of knowledge in the light of Catholicism's commitment to a universal view of reality. A number of Catholic institutions in the last few years, and I could mention Notre Dame, DePaul, Seton Hall, Boston College, in addition to Dayton, have developed new approaches to hiring and to rewarding faculty for commitment to engaging the Catholic intellectual tradition, the unity of knowledge, and the complementarity of faith and reason uh, I would just like to abstract from those for a moment and try to suggest an approach to hiring uh, the mission that would involve 
several interdependent but distinct categories. First, an affirmative action plan for hiring Catholic faculty in line with Ex Corte Ecclesiae's insistence on the importance of the role of Catholic faculty in the Catholic University. This strategy would require a variety of initiatives, each incomplete in isolation from the others, but I would include the following. First, as Father Heff suggested, university appointments of senior Catholic scholars with a distinguished reputation for teaching and research who have in explicit and sustained ways drawn upon the rich and complex intellectual, social, artistic, and spiritual traditions of the church. Now, I would favor both external candidates as well as internal candidates for this because I think it gives a senior administration an opportunity to bring in a very visible Catholic scholar to have a role within the life of the institution. Such appointments might carry a university chair or a distinguished professor classification and can highlight the university's own deepest commitments. On the other hand, I have to concede what Robert Sullivan at Notre Dame has pointed out, that when um, you hire someone on this level, it has the disadvantage that it may not have a significant impact on the culture of the faculty and university as a whole, because these appointments to some degree stand outside the normal course of university appointments. Second, through the development of a network of faculty and administrators, identify promising junior level Catholic faculty and doctoral candidates for recruitment to the universities. I think it's an impossible situation if we just wait to see who applies. I mean, you think we're purposeful. I mean, no, no business would operate this way. If we're purposeful, we'll go out and recruit faculty for our institutions. And I think we have to do that both at the junior and the senior level. Universities are now reporting an increase, both in the number and quality of young Catholic scholars seeking to contribute to the life of Catholic higher education. Third, in order to recruit committed Catholic scholars and others who share a deep understanding of the distinctive nature and promise of Catholic higher education, we'll need to create a vibrant institutional culture that encourages and rewards sustained exploration of the historical expressions and contemporary relevance of the Catholic intellectual tradition. This will require new commitments of resources to the work of faculty development programs which encourage the rich interdisciplinary reflection to which our institutions are committed. It is insufficient simply to recruit a new faculty. The university needs also to develop a new institutional culture and openings for an intentional faith community in our campuses. But in addition to this focus on the recruitment of Catholic faculty, a hiring for mission plan needs to seek as well committed women, women and men from other Christian denominations and from other faith traditions who demonstrate both the respect for and a knowledge of the distinctive claims of the Catholic intellectual tradition and its role in the university. Such faculty will and have made a critical contribution to the university's mission in the light of their own faith tradition and not in isolation from the distinctive claims of the Catholic intellectual tradition. We need clearly to foster a broad approach to the ultimate complementarity of faith and reason on our campuses. All of us here know colleagues of other Christian denominations and other faith traditions who make exceptionally important contributions to the Catholic mission and identity, and we must continue to recruit them to our campuses and to do so intentionally as part of a larger hiring for mission plan. And I would add as well that I think a hiring for mission plan needs to seek to attract to the university those who have either a distinguished record of teaching and scholarship or the promise for developing such a record, who have a de demonstrated respect for and understanding of the distinctive claims of the Catholic University, but who may not have any explicit commitment to a particular faith tradition. Nonetheless, as John Paul II said in Ex Corte Ecclesiae, such scholars can make a real and essential contribution to the university's mission in light of their own disciplinary competence and commitment. It is important to emphasize that these faculty are crucial to the Catholic University's engagement with the unity of knowledge, and their role in the university is then not secondary or marginal. It is clear that among the difficulties which are likely to be encountered in developing into a hiring for mission plan, uh, there will be significant opposition. It is countercultural in the light of the present bureaucratic reality of higher education. Nonetheless, I think there is some reason to be hopeful. In terms of recruitment, um, 
it seems to me that several things are necessary, uh, and I just want to mention a few of them quickly. Chuck Zuck indicated in his uh, re reflection on the survey uh, that only one third of the institutions he surveyed routinely indicated in their recruitment plans that faculty were expected to be supportive of the university's Catholic mission. The university needs to develop language which is both clear and unapologetic about its commitments while recognizing the diversity of its faculty and student body. Second, there need to be clear guidelines for search committees about university and departmental criteria for faculty that will be implemented consistently and vigorously. Third, new language and guidelines are essential but insufficient in themselves. The administration will need to require the presence of qualified candidates among the finalists and a commitment on their part to the distinctive Catholic mission of the university. Final point I'd make on this point is that the appointment of faculty is finally the responsibility of the president and he or she has the obligation to clarify the, that right and its implications for the university's identity and mission. But as Father Half pointed out, once hired, uh, this commitment to a sustained exploration of the Catholic mission of the university cannot stop. Once hired, Catholic uh, faculty of any kind need to have regular opportunities and university incentives to examine and reflect upon the specific implications of the university's mission. The university needs to create a wide variety of faculty programs that help us form and, and sustain faculty as they develop their own roles within the university. And the same has to be said about promotion and tenure. One would expect that there would be negative reactions from some faculty within Catholic universities to a serious reform of existing hiring policies. On the other hand, we have already experienced the significant negative reactions to Catholic identity of many of our institutions without a compensating advance in the development of its claims. A clear and coherent policy can ultimately be successful if strategically, carefully, and purposefully in implemented. I've chosen to focus on a top-down approach partly complement Father Half's approach to hiring for mission and faculty development, but also because I think in the end, the president has a formal responsibility for mission and identity. If that responsibility is not assumed and new reward structures put in place, the institutional weight of university proceduralism will eventually overwhelm bottom-up approaches. Nevertheless, our work in Catholic studies at the University of St. Thomas has been precisely this bottom-up kind. And I agree that in the climate of the last 20 years, the voluntary faculty-initiated bottom-up approach has been both richer and more creative than any administrative initiative. But I think we are now in a different moment, one in which our Catholic identity will be necessary not only to secure our deepest commitments to a distinctive philosophy of education, but also to secure our future in an increasingly competitive and standardized university model. Whatever the risks, I think that we must begin to institutionalize the renewal, and that will require a concerted but converging and diverse set of administrative initiatives at the highest level. A final point. Many of our institutions, including my own, have reached a size, complexity, and diversity that make it inconceivable that they will return to their simpler, more homogeneous form. Nor do I think it appropriate that we make such an attempt. The Catholic University as such has never been a sectarian project, and it has always taken seriously the obligation to reverence the truth wherever it is found, and that in the most unlikely of places. Nonetheless, if this great tradition is to survive and flourish, we will need to give a more positive account of the role of the church in this complex pluralism a role which is both authoritative and dialogical at once. At a time of significant competition for students and for resources, we might now have a new opportunity to articulate and implement a more robust and deep expression of our Catholic identity. But opportunities are not typically long-lived, and I think that the next 10 years will be in new ways decisive for the future of Catholic higher education in the United States. Thank you. First of all, our collective thanks go to Father Jim Heft and Professor Don Breel for two excellent and thought-provoking presentations on how Catholic universities might better assert their identity through the composition of their faculty. And I particularly appreciated 
how our two presenters, perhaps intentionally, perhaps not, uh, coordinated their remarks to provide both a bottom-up, Father Jim, and top-down, Don Briel, perspective to Catholic faculty development. Uh, this complementarity uh, offers us at our different institutions with different challenges additional nuance and additional options. So, um, what I briefly, and I emphasize briefly, will comment here uh, is mainly inspired by the remarks that we just heard, uh, but I think it also reflects my own experiences as a student, as a faculty member, and as a central administrator at a Catholic university and a college of business administration embedded in one. Firstly, I think we can certainly stipulate that faculty members are front and center in making the Catholic identity of our universities both effective and spiritually empowered. Quite often, Catholic universities commit substantial resources in order to create thoughtful programs that enhance and vitalize Catholic identity. And I know in my own work as a, in, in central administration and on university budget committees, we regularly talked about having a critical mass of financial resources available to do programming and to support the mission of the university. But that said, programs and money being in place, persons of goodwill are still required in order to implement these programs. And in a Catholic university, it stands to reason that such Persons must include a core of faculty members who are knowledgeable of both the Catholic tradition as well as, as its intellectual and educational ideals. And hence, you know, programs like the one that we are participating in this week. But more centrally, as business majors now compose one-fifth of Catholic university students the realm of faculty specifically within the business school cannot and must not be ignored. And I think it is our professional schools that represent the biggest challenges in securing faculty participation to the development of the Catholic identity. A second point inspired by the comments that we've just heard. Here's the challenge as I see it. Most of our institutions have a number, perhaps a small number, of faculty who are truly committed, those that get it. But what about the rest? Well, most of my uh, business school colleagues, and I'm not just talking about my own university, but at many other places that I have visited in different sorts of capacities, are not, not, actively opposed in any way to the integration of the Catholic intellectual tradition into our students' learning or, or, or what have you. And there may be a few such opponents, I suppose, but I don't think there's a significant number. Um, neither uh, do I find that there are a lot of business school professors who exhibit some sort of overt aloofness to things spiritual, such that they might give our students pause from engaging in programs of spiritual development or social ministries that our universities offer. Although again, um, as we think about our own personal experiences, we might have occasionally encountered a professor that embodies such condescension and public skepticism. Mostly what we have in the business schools, I think, and, and perhaps this owes to the embedded academic training in the ideology of economics and finance that our business professors receive. Here's what I find. I find many, many faculty members of impeccable faith, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, who strongly believe that most religious concerns should be compartmentalized 
in the voluntary activities of our personal lives. And therefore, they would assert when asked that when we professionally engage the business realm, free market machinations and outcomes should be embraced and celebrated, both in terms of how managers practice their commercial endeavors and in terms of the business curriculum that we academics construct. And that's the obstacle. And I would add that members of the board of, boards of trustees especially those who are from the business community, former CEOs and top managers, are often kindred spirits in exhibiting this philosophy of compartmentalization. The idea that the business of business is to maximize wealth, and the church plays a supplementary and supportive role that should mostly manifest itself outside of the major activities that business undertakes. <clears throat> Third point. It strikes me, and uh, I guess with some irony, uh, that our business school faculty, for the most part, gladly embrace affirmative actions in hiring when it comes to gender and ethnicity and, and perhaps that's driven by the increasing diversity and global profile of the students that we are educating, but they resist overt initiatives to interject Catholicity as a substantive factor in uh, faculty hiring. And perhaps, and I emphasize perhaps, this implies that maybe top-down approaches, the kind that Don Briel spoke of, to uh, top-down approaches to faculty hiring and, and, and development uh, should be more prominent in order to what? In order to offset the disciplinary instrumentality that operates at the department level at most business schools. And despite the clear exhortations of, of ex corde, and maybe I'm limiting myself here to a, a perspective of North American business schools and those that have a research mandate, uh, I'm wondering, I am not aware of strategic inquiries by presidents and, and, and provosts to ascertain and amend the extent of impactful Catholic presence in our business faculty, that is in terms of meeting the exhortations of, of, of ex corde. Um, so uh, I, would, um, I would speculate that if such interventions did occur, again, at, at uni Catholic universities uh, that have a strong research mandate, um, that, that such efforts would be met with resistance by most segments of the business faculty, including resistance from many of our Catholic business colleagues. Finally, uh, our presenters have appropriately segmented the task of, of uh, institutionalizing Catholic identity um, into hiring and development and retention of faculty. And with regard to our collective progress in these sectors, uh, I'd like to offer the following subjective grades or evaluations, if nothing else, to, to get the conversation going. With regard to hiring business faculty, I would give us a C or an average. Uh, I think that we have done as well as we have done due to a very helpful uh, self-selection process, owing in part to faculty members who as students were educated at Catholic universities. And, and sometimes I would add that they were educated at Catholic universities in disciplines that were outside of business and economics. In terms of developing Catholic business faculty, I would give us a B minus or a pretty good grade. Um, as identified in the presentations and, uh, that we've had at this conference, vitalized in, in various papers that have been presented already or that we will hear in the uh, coming two days, uh, I think there are an abundance of opportunities for faculty 
um, uh, at Catholic universities uh, available, programming options available for them to engage Catholic identity uh, on a limited basis if they so choose or even on a more complete basis. And the availability of such options helps us advance Catholic missions in our colleges and universities. Finally, with regard to faculty retention based on mis mission contribution, uh, the grade I would hand out is F or failure. In my opinion, the instrumentality of departmental objectives and the allegiance of our academic disciplines over the local university results in candidates for promotion and their contributions to Catholic identity being de minimis in discussions and recommendations of academic promotion and tenure. And that's what happens at the departmental level. I recall being on a self-study visitation for accreditation purposes at another Catholic university, and I remember talking to a senior faculty member about a junior faculty member who was a consumer behaviorist, and he basically said, look, we hired this person as a consumer psychologist, and now they spend far too much of their time taking student groups on mission trips. I will not be supporting. And that is the sort of challenge we face adjudicating the discipline mission trade-off that we face. Again, my thanks to Father Jim and Don Brill for today's presentations and, and to both of you for all that you do to advance Catholic higher education. I look forward to the question and answer session on our topic and the various conversations about these matters as they, as they unfold in the course of this conference. Thank you.